Hi, it's Dr. Alan Yim. Today I'm showing you how to analyze a modulation using a secondary dominant as a common chord. So for this example, I'm going to be using this movement from a Beethoven piano sonata. It's an early sonata, opus 14, number two in G major, and the opening sounds like this. So, some things to notice right away. I'll point out the third and fourth measures. Okay, so of course we expect the tonic chord to be in the beginning, and it is G major. Then the next measure, it contains a second inversion chord, C over G. Whenever you write a second inversion chord, or whenever you see a second inversion chord, it's a good idea to try to figure out how it's being used. So in this case, you might look at it and notice that the bass note has not changed. So this is a pedal 6-4. And the second, this... So 6-4 chords are very unstable. You, you only want to use them as a pedal, a passing. If there's a bass arpeggiation, you might see a 6-4. Uh, or as a cadential, the most common and the most useful one. When you're analyzing this, you would put the C over G, the 464 four in parentheses, if you include it in your analysis, just to indicate that it's not really a chord progression to four, but it's, it's a, a second inversion pedal. Okay, going ahead. So second system, second measure. Okay, there's the dominant. First, in first inversion, and then a seven, and then one. So there's the tonicization of one, and then two. And here we have another second inversion chord. You could probably guess what this is because this is one six four, and it's a cadential six four. This is the formula one and five. I'm sorry, one six four. What's fun about this is if you look at the second system, this measure here, we have one, six, four, and then notice the melody does something that's kind of maybe a little bit unexpected. We have. Now you probably wouldn't ask a singer to do that because that's a leap of a ninth, but for the pianist, it's just like a. All right, so does that seventh resolve Normally, the leap down to the seventh, yes, it does. Okay, so Beethoven does follow the rules, but within those rules, he does sometimes things that you don't expect. And that's just, I think, in a, a one example of something that's a little fun to notice, and, and you should bring it out if you're playing this. So again, I'll play this a little bit here. here. Okay, so did you hear and see where the modulation took place? This is a typical modulation in major. This is a piano sonata, so you might expect that it's going to go, if it's major, from the tonic key to the dominant. We started in G, we're going to D, we're going to the dominant, and you could see it happening because you start looking for the key signature, the change. Instead of just one sharp, we add in the C sharp to create D major, and you see it down here. So let me play that little transition again, and we're going to try to discover where the common chord is. Now in common chord modulation, there are a couple things to notice. You want it to be smooth. It, that's kind of the goal of common chord modulation because the chord is in both keys. It smooths over the transition. 
because you want it smooth, you don't want it to happen at the beginning or the end of the phrase. You want it to happen in the middle. And you probably will put it in some place where it's not the main melody. You put it in a transitional area where maybe there's some scales or something less important. So here, uh, we've already kind of, if you remember up here, we've kind of finished this main little thing, right? We had all this. shortens this thing a little bit and here we go sequence okay now we're on the dominant of the dominant a so the modulation is happening over here and if you notice we have g over b then we have a over c so we're still in the key the original key at this point. So we have one six and then two six. And then we have an A major chord going to D. So this looks like five of five to five or better, maybe it's five one in the new key. So this chord looks like it's the transition, but it's non-diatonic. So if you were looking for a common chord, maybe you would go back to this one. All right, but let's take a look at this chord. This is A minor over C. So, um, so A minor over C in the key of D would be a five, six, but a minor five, six. So this one maybe is a little bit unlikely as a pivot chord because it doesn't really function in the new key. We would expect this chord, the dominant, and in any case, um, well, so maybe as a better option, we should consider this to be the pivot. And if we did this in the original key, it's five of five, five, six, five of uh, five, six, five of five to be more precise. And in the new key, five, six, five, just plain old five, six, five. So we're going to call this the pivot chord. And oftentimes when you see a secondary chord being used as a pivot chord, you will notice that this chord on this side functions in the starting key, but not in the new one. And this one functions in the new chord, but not in the old one. So you're kind of left with the secondary chord as the pivot, functioning sometimes as a secondary chord in both sides, on both sides of the piece. Okay, so that's where the modulation takes place. I'm going to point out one last thing before I close, and that is kind of the structure of this whole little opening section of this. So we start in G, we have a nice theme, and then it starts going into this kind of transitional thing that has its own little motives. And then we hang out on five for a long time. So you notice A starting here all the way to here. So there's kind of a large proportion of this one whole section, one, two, three, four, five, six measures, actually seven maybe, if you want to think of it this way, seven measures out of these opening, oh, they're not numbered. Okay, well, you can kind of eyeball this. Out of the whole, maybe 20 something measures, seven of them are just on the dominant to the new key. And this is so typical of Beethoven. Other composers do this as well. But Beethoven, when I think of somebody hanging out on the dominant for a long time, I think of Beethoven. And it's, it really adds a lot of suspense to the music because you, cut, you just can't wait to get to the one chord. So as a composer, if you want to create a lot of suspense, you could just hang out on five or five seven and never really give the one, or if you do, show one maybe not in root position or maybe the the top the melody is on the fifth of the chord something that is not quite the um the tonic chord in root position so let's see what that sounds like uh, starting from here where the modulation begins <laughs> Okay, so 
when you get to that point, hopefully it comes a little bit as a relief. And you might notice another thing, and this is also kind of normal, the whole section here is piano, so soft. Now, sorry I'm playing this keyboard, but the, the piano actually is maybe even more suspenseful. It's like somebody sneaking up on you, or just you see a cat waiting to pounce on something. It's that winding up of energy rather than you know, letting out the energy. It's the opposite. So, um, though there's no marking here, and I wouldn't go, you know, announcing that one is here, uh, you should have some kind of sense of relief when you do reach the one chord. Okay, that's it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it sort of gave you a little bit of insight into some of the little small details that are used in classical music that really make the music um, surprising, come to life, and make it interesting to listen to many times over because it gives you an opportunity to always discover something new. Thanks for watching.